Good afternoon. Welcome to Lift and Rift Ministries. My name is Patrick Bostito, and today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Um, if you've got your Bible with you, open it up to Romans chapter 8. If you don't have it, take a moment, get it, open up to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to um, go through verses 1 through 17 here this afternoon. Um, this is my video that, that we're going to be preaching here today. Uh, hopefully you've been watching my other videos where we're going through verse by verse, the book of John. Hope you're enjoying that. Let's pray and we're going to get started here today. Heavenly Father, we come to you this afternoon. Lord, we're thankful for the day that you've given us, Lord, uh, the day that we get to come and, and worship you freely, Lord. And I, I'm thankful for this technology, for this ability to do this, Lord, for the opportunity to do it. Lord, I ask that you bless this message here today. Bless the listener. Lord, be with me. Help me to empty myself of me, Lord, and, and allow me to have you fill me with your spirit, Lord. And if anyone within the sound of my voice does not know you as their personal Savior, I pray today, today, that they come to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, my name is Patrick Bostito, and, and we're looking at Romans chapter 8 this morning, or this afternoon, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. So author uh, Conan Doyle, the ingenious creator of the Sherlock Holmes uh, mysteries once found great humor in a practical joke he played on 12 famous friends of his. Each of this men, these men were uh, victorious and highly respected uh, men in the community and, and in their surrounding fields, what they were doing. And for the joke, Doyle sent every one of them the same telegram. Now, this is back when they didn't have text messages and and Facebook and stuff like that. So he sent telegrams. Here's what the telegram said. It said, fly at once. All is discovered. Fly at once. All is discovered. Within 24 hours, the dozen men of noble reputations had taken a trip out of the country. No matter how noble our reputation is, and this is what it shows you, no matter how noble our reputation is, we all have things that in which we're ashamed of and hope that nobody discovers. Each and every one of us, no matter how famous, how noble, how poor, how unknown we are, we all have things in our past, in our lives, that we don't want anyone to know about. The only lasting solution to the guilty conscience, though, is forgiveness from God it's himself. We used to do our you at our church, and in doing our you, there was a principle, accept the responsibility for our actions, and God will remove that guilt. We accept our responsibilities for what I do. The Bible tells us if we go to God and we ask his forgiveness, he will clear us of that guilty conscience that we have. We know that God forgives us if we are his children, and in order to be his children, we have to be saved. You know, people say we're all God's children, and that's a lie. If you're not saved, you're not a child of God. You are created from God. God created you, but you're not his child. Now, in the next few moments here, we're going to deal with our failures. We're going to deal with a lot of our failures. Sin is an obvious failure for us. What God would hope is not that we would dwell on those failures, but rather we'd learn something from them, that we learn from them. In fact, before I become buried in guilt, I'd like to keep this story in mind as we talk, uh, as we go through and we look at this tough topic of sin. A Louisiana farmer had a favorite mule, and the farmer and that favorite mule were walking along, and that mule fell in a well. After studying the situation, the farmer came to the conclusion that he couldn't pull the mule out. The mule was just too heavy, and he wouldn't be able to do it. So he might as well bury him and put him out of his misery. It would be the humane thing to do than letting him sit there and starve or, or get dehydrated and die of thirst. So he got a truckload of dirt and backed up to the well and he dumped the dirt in on top of the mule at the bottom of the well. But when the dirt hit the mule, it started snorting and trampling. As it trampled, it began to work itself up on top of the dirt. So the farmer continued to pour dirt in the well until the mule snorted and tramped its way to the top and then walked away, a dirtier but wiser mule. 
What was intended to bury it turned out to be our salvation. The devil's going to lie to us and tell us that these things we're dealing with, this sin, um, when we mess up, that it's going to bury us, it's going to destroy us. What he means for destruction in our lives, God, if we turn to him and we are of his, will turn that into good and glory for his purpose. Being stuck in a deep well of sin and its consequences is a terrible experience. You know, there's consequences for everything we do, good and bad. And at some point, we're going to have to pay those consequences. They're going to have to come out. So as we look at this, I want to look at number one. Well, first, let's read our scripture. Verses 1 through 17 of Romans. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ. Jesus hath made us me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. But the Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So the destructive power of sin is what we're going to look at first. The destructive power of sin. Part of the beauty of Romans chapter 8 comes from the position in Paul's letter. This position in Paul's letter. Um, in the preceding chapters, Paul takes a look at his own life, his own life, and his own shortcomings, and writes words like these. And let's look at uh, Romans chapter 7, verses 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. 18 and 19. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. And then verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, we taught in our you, and I believe it's a very good principle, that when you come across Scripture, you should break it apart, you should dissect it, you should define it, and put it back together in your own words to fully understand what it's saying. Those verses that I just read to you, here's what I got out of that. For I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not practice what I want to do. But I do what I hate, for I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice evil that I do not want to do. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this dying body? So Paul saying here, he has this stuff. He 
He has these things that he's dealing with. These things that he knows he should be doing, but his flesh doesn't want to do them, so he doesn't do it. How much is that like us in our lives? We know things that we should do, but we don't do it. Children, um, when we raise up our children, they know they should have, uh, or they know what they have to do, like responsibilities and chores, um, taking out the trash maybe. But their flesh doesn't want to do it. Their flesh wants to appease to what they want to do. And if we make way for our flesh, that's what we're giving into that flesh, and it becomes easier and easier to follow the things of the flesh. Had Paul ended his letter, though, there, back with that, oh, man, it would have been probably the most depressing scripture there is, aside from Jesus being crucified. Paul crying out, oh, what a wretched man I am. Not necessarily because we're uh, disappointed in Paul or what he's got going on in his life, but because it rings so true of each of our hearts. We know we're a sinful people. We know we sin. So we can relate to him. So Dr. Bob Record tells a story of a major move that um, was set to take place in a major Fortune 500 company. It was unheard of, but the company was ready to promote a 38-year-old from vice president to president. From vice president to president. He was only 38 years old when this happened. 38 years old. The young man was very, very impressive businessman who wooed and awed the board of directors. He was so good. Upon completing the final interview process, the board broke for lunch with plans to offer the man this prestigious position. So the young man went to lunch alone that day and was unintentionally followed by several of the board members who happened to stand behind him in line. They ended up going to the same place for lunch. Naturally, they were watching him closely, filled with pride and excitement about this coming uh, announcement they were going to make. This is the guy we got that's going to lead our company. Just then, everything changed. When the young man came to the bread section, he placed two three-cent pats of butter on his tray and nonchalantly covered up the, with a napkin. When he paid for his meal, he did not reveal his stolen treasures. An hour later, a room that should have been filled with joy was instead marked by anger. And instead of being promoted to president, the young man with the promising future was fired, all for six cents worth of butter. They fired him. The smallest sins in our lives is costly. When this board of directors seen this young man, he was willing to steal butter for three cents. What is he going to do with millions and millions of dollars worth of stuff is where their mindset went. The smallest of our sins is far more costly than ever have imagined. Thankfully, Paul turned his attention away from his own sin that he was talking about and back to the one who set him free from sin. The joy he had written in God's grace is what makes Romans 8 one of the greatest chapters in the Bible, I believe. Romans 8 is about grace. Number two, God has broken the power of sin. Paul says that God had already set him free from the law of sin and death. Look at verse number one again. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Listen. If you're saved, if Jesus is in you, you're no longer condemned to death. You know, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. When we're in Christ, we no longer have that debt to pay. Christ paid it for us when he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again in three days. And that while he couldn't beat sin that had hounded him, God did by sending his own son. This is coming from a, a chapter 7 man who still battled sinful learnings, a man who often lost those battles, a man like us. We go through life, and if you're honest with yourself, we sin daily. We sin daily. We do. The law was put here, 
and I'm talking about God's law, was put here to show us that we needed a different way. We needed another way out. We needed someone to help us. This should be a relief to us. God has already done the hard work in tackling the sin problem because of the cross. Sin is defeated. It's defeated. Sin no longer holds us. Satan's greatest threat to any of us is permanent separation from God because of our own sin. Satan sates the trap and hopes we fall into it. But when Jesus gave up his life for the sake of sinners, the ultimate power of sin was defeated once and for all. Even though all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 8, uh, 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When we accept the gift of God's grace, we can still experience God's glory as if we had never sinned. Uh, John, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 is written to those who are saved. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us from our sin and, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God has pro, pro, uh, promised to forgive us and to cleanse us. Now, our sin has already been forgiven. It's already been forgiven when Jesus died on the cross, past, present, and future. And there's a lot of people that think, because it's forgiven, why do I have to tell him? He knows anyway. God wants us to ask for his help, just as any father wants their children to ask for help. So we all sin, we all fall away, and we keep doing the same things over and over again. So. When I was younger, I had a friend named John, and I used to go and spend time with John all the time, and we'd spend weekends. As a matter of fact, I went down once, and, and there was this blizzard. I ended up being there for two weeks because the blizzard came, and nothing was open. I couldn't get away. So anyway, one of these times I was down with John. John had a pet hamster. He had a pet hamster. My daughter, Sierra, has a guinea pig. Um, guinea pigs are a lot like hamsters. Uh, but this hamster, his name was Hammy. Hammy had everything that a hamster could want in his cage. He had the nice cedar bedding. He had a water bottle that gave him water and, and uh, the food bowl. And he even had a little wheel to do exercises on, a little hamster wheel that he can get in and run and stretch his legs. What I found out Hammy would do, though, as I was sitting there watching, he walked over to the wheel, and I'm expecting him to get into the wheel and run. But what he does is he climbs up on top of the wheel. He climbs up on top, and he spins over on his back, and he stretches his back over the wheel, and he starts to go down head first, and it goes, and it goes, and it goes, until wham! He smacks his head on the ground. And he gets up, and he shakes his little hamster head, and I'm thinking to myself, he learned his lesson. But what does he do? He gets on the wheel again and does the same thing. He stretches onto his back, down and down, and then wham, hits his head again. He hits his head again. Why? Why would a hamster who has everything he needs disregard the wheel's proper use and do something that only hurts himself? Why would he do that? And why, even after that, would he do it again? And he, again, he ended up doing it three or four times. But why? He has everything he wants. That's not what the wheel's for. Why would he use it like that? The bigger question is, why do human beings, us, why do we do those same things over and over again, knowing it's going to hurt us? And we're supposed to be smarter than hamsters but we end up doing the same thing. Tom Watson Sr. is a man who founded IBM. You can imagine the money, the investments, the experiments this man in his multi-billion dollar enterprise has made through the years. Once, years ago, when a million dollars was still a million dollars and it was actually still a lot of money, Watson had a top junior executive who spent $12 million of the company's money on a venture that failed. The venture failed. The executive put in his resignation on Watson's desk saying, I'm sure that you want my resignation. Watson roared back, no, I don't want your resignation. 
I've just spent $12 million educating you, and it's about time you get to work. You see, just like Tom Watson Sr., God is a lot like that with us. He will not accept our resignation. He won't accept it. Instead, he'll accept our failures as part of the investment he has made in our spiritual growth, our spiritual growth. God allows us sometimes to go through things, to fail at things, as a way to grow us, to depend on him more. But now he expects us to get to work, to learn from those mistakes. So let's do it. The second point of this message is the workroom that requires the most sweat and toil. We need work. But part of it, part of our game plan, part of this this whole thing, part of our game, game plan, is to know that it can be done. Sin doesn't have the power to hold us prisoner anymore. God had broken those chains. He's broken them. Um, there's a song that talks about him being a chain breaker. And that's exactly what he is. This is what Jesus had in mind when he cried on those words on the cross. It is finished. Now, I don't know about you. But in my understanding, the word finished means done. There's no more that needs to be done. And you think about racers and competitions who are running races. When they cross the finish line, um, NASCAR maybe. I'm not a big NASCAR fan, but I know the basic principles of it. NASCAR, when they go and get the checkered flag, they've won the race if they're in first place. They don't need to keep running that race trying to earn a victory. It's finished. The race is over. It's done. There's nothing else that needs to be done. Number th three, refuse the power of sin. The instruction from verse eight sounds from familiar from our biblical teaching, from other biblical teachings, according to what Paul writes uh, here, verses five and eight. Look at verses five through eight. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then, so they that are in the flesh cannot please God. The mindset on what our sinful nature desires will live by that sinful nature. On the other hand, if we set our minds on what the Spirit desires, we will live according to the Spirit. One mindset leads to death, while the other to life. One mindset leads to hostility with God, but the other leads to peace with God. The very first psalm teaches the same principle, only with a different word picture. Picture. Psalms 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Dissecting and divine, uh, defining again. How happy is the man who does not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path of sinners, or join a group of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction. And he meditates on it day and night. A man who meditates on the word of God will delight himself and delight God. But a man who doesn't control his mind will slowly, slowly, first to a walk, uh, start walking with the counsel of the wicked. Then he will stand in the way of sinners. He'll start doing what they're doing. And finally, he'll sit and take the seat of mock, uh, mockers. We should run a good race for Christ not even slowing to a walk, not even slowing to a walk. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he was drawn away of his own lust and enticed. 
Then when lust hath conceived, it conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So if we can go backwards through these steps, from death to sin, from sin to the birth of sin, from birth of sin to the desire of sin, we'll come to the point of our own evil desires. If at that point we take hold of the mind of Christ, we can break the progressive train and stop that destructive cycle. In RU, we also taught and learned that whatever we do in life, whatever there is, before we ever do anything, we think about it. That thought is there first. Paul says here in, in Romans chapter 8 that the key to set is to set our minds free and set it on what the Spirit desires. Is that a bad thing? The tempter would have us think that we just missed out on some great experiences, that God has actually punished us for living, uh, leaving a life of sin. But picture this, when a man and woman fall in love and get married, they automatically stop some of the practices and start some others. For instance, both husband and wife stop dating other people and start enjoying the companionship for which they had so long searched. So the devil tries to tell us God's going to punish us and that we've missed up on, uh, on so much. I didn't get saved until I was 34 years old. And I have way more fun now being saved and not partaking in all that stuff that I used to than I ever did back then, ever. I'm not missing anything. I'm not missing anything at all. So later in Romans chapter 12, Paul writes these words to those who uh, want to please God. Be not conformed. Let me turn there, Romans chapter 12. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable, acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul is basically saying here, do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of, the, of your mind. Your transformed mind will make all the difference in life when it comes to enjoying or uh, despising your walk with Christ. The power to break free from the chains of sin, the power that God has already provided, is already available to us right now. So just before he was executed for his terrible crimes, mass murderer Ted Bundy told James Dobson that his road to prison had begun with a look at a pornographic magazine. Porn was immediately addictive for him, and it led to actions that were against God and society. On the other hand, author and pastor Mark Ladoko took control of his mind and walked away from a potential problem with alcoholism. Ladoko says, I come from a family of alcoholism. If there is anything about this DNA stuff, I've got it. For more than 20 years, drinking wasn't a major, major issue for Ladoko. But in 2000. In 20, or 2001, it nearly became one. Ladaka recalled, I lowered my guard one bit. One beer with a barbecue won't hurt. Then another time with Mexican food. Then a time or two with no food at all. One afternoon on his way to speak at a men's retreat, he began to plot. Where could I buy a beer and not be seen by anyone I know? He drove to an out-of-the-way convenience store, parked and waited until all the patrons left. He entered, bought the beer, held it close to his side, and hurried to his car. He says, I felt a sense of conviction because the night before I had a long talk with my oldest daughter about not covering things up. Ladako didn't drink that beer. Instead, he rolled down the window, threw it in the trash bin, and asked God for forgiveness. But it didn't stop there. He also decided to come clean with the elders of the church about what happened. He said, when I shared with the elders, they just looked at me across the table and said, Satan is determined to get you for this right now. 
We're going to cover this with prayer, but you've got to get the alcohol out of your life. And I really took that from, as it was from God. Satan tried to destroy this man, and he fell into the temptation. And when he found out that God does not only forgive, but God restores. God restores as well. God also restores. Number four. Live powerfully apart from sin. Romans 8, again, 12 through 14. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you, ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. How you live is going to make a difference in the way you enjoy life. Take the example of sexuality. A lifestyle of sexual sin can lead to embarrassment, physical and medical ramifications, financial penalties, and guilt-written sense of spiritual bankruptcy. On the other hand, a lifestyle that honors God's plan for it and the rules that he places around it can enrich a marriage and create joy. Controlling your mind and making progress in the battle against temptation becomes evident as we manifest the spiritual fruit of the Spirit, and the love, joy, peace, and those as found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Those rewards are worth the effort. Having a powerful way to live is worth the battle. So with all this concentration on sin, most of us are left with a little bit of worry. Probably. Does God really have enough grace for a sinner like me? Author and pastor Lee Strobel tells this story. Shortly after the Korean War, a Korean woman had an affair with an American soldier. She ended up getting pregnant. He went back to the United States and she never saw him again. She gave birth to a little girl who looked different than the other Korean children. She had light-colored, curly hair, and in that culture, children of mixed race were ostracized by the community. In fact, many women would kill their children because they didn't want them to face such a rejection. But this woman didn't do that. She tried to raise her little girls best she could until the rejection was too much. She did something that probably nobody in this, in the sound of my voice can imagine ever doing. She abandoned her little girl to the streets. The little girl was ruthlessly taunted by people. They called her the ugliest word in the Korean language, Tuki. Tuki, that word means alien devil. It didn't take long for this little girl to draw Conclusions about herself based on the way people treated her. You know, bullying people, talking about people. As human beings, if we hear something long enough, we end up believing it. For two years, she lived on the streets until finally she made her way to an orphanage. One day, word came that a couple from America was going to adopt a little boy. All the... All the uh, adopt a little boy. All the children in the orphanage got excited because at least one little boy was going to have hope. He was going to have a family. So this little girl spent the day cleaning up all the little boys and giving them baths, combing their hair, and wondering which one would be adopted by the American couple. The next day, the couple came, and this is what the girl we called. The couple came in expecting to adopt a little boy. When they got there, they noticed how clean and well kept all these little boys were and, and asked how that was possible. And the little girl spoke up and said that she knew they were coming to adopt a boy and she wanted them to look presentable for him. So she cleaned them up and 
got them ready for the visit. Well, that American couple ended up adopting that little girl. They adopted her because she was humble in her spirit. She didn't get angry because she wasn't going to get adopted. She was humble. And she was happy for the little boys. And she wanted to help them. So they adopted the little girl. She ended up getting saved and is now a missionary to Korea. So with all our scars, with all of our wrong that's in us, with all the terrible consequences our sin has laid upon us, God still wants us. The cross is the proof. Romans 8 is the love letter. The only unknown about the entire story is whether those who hear the invitation will accept the offer of adoption by grace. Let's pray and and I'll be done this afternoon. Heavenly Father, we come to you again this afternoon, Lord. We're thankful for the time you've given us. Lord, we're thankful for the promises in your word that when we come to you, when we accept you, Lord, we can call you Abba, Father. We can call you Daddy, Lord, that we will become joint heirs with Christ. We will become heirs and become one of your children. Lord, I pray that Anyone who's heard this message and doesn't know you will reach out to me or somebody they know who is living for you and is saved by you, Lord, and and consider and and figure out how to go about it. Lord, I ask that you are with us as we go throughout the rest of our days. Be with our evening service at church tonight. Be with pastor as he brings the message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining. Tune back in Monday morning as we get back into the book of John. And may you be blessed with truth today.